NFO number two, Staley and Rust, recorded October 5th. <coughs> Welcome to another program of U.S. Farm Report, brought to you by members of the National Farmers Organization in this listening area, in the interest of agriculture, rural business, and the well-being of our nation. We have as our special guest, Oren Lee Staley, President of the National Farmers Organization, and Albin Rust, Dairy Commodity Director of the NFO. Ladies and gentlemen, we appreciate the opportunity to come into your home and visit with you, particularly about daring this afternoon. But nevertheless, we want to visit about the other commodities at the same time. It is now being generally recognized that the NFO's collective bargaining program has been one of the big and most people, or at least many of them, consider the biggest factor in the unexpected price rise on hogs that has been maintained. The price rise on cattle that has been maintained through the heavy slaughtering of cattle this year. And so this means that certainly as we have built the collective bargaining program of the NFO over a vast area, we have added to the meat marketing arrangements uh, the grain program, which has in its principal at least uh, theory and the principal practice of on in position sales. This makes it possible for members of the NFO that raise grain to decide what time of the year they want to sell that grain and then put it in position for sale either, either in the local elevators uh, that has been arranged for by county NFO grain bargaining committees that uh, these people of course have been elected from the NFO members within the county or uh, use in position uh, from farm storage. Now this is all important because the NFO recognizes that you cannot just work on one commodity uh, and maintain any success that you make on that commodity without uh, also working on all the other major commodities. Therefore, we're working very hard in an overall bargaining program, and dairy is, of course, one of the major commodities and one of the very important commodities. And I have with me Mr. Alvin Rust, who is director of our dairy commodity department, He's a dairy farmer from Hillsdale, Wisconsin, and of course it would be only appropriate to have a head of our dairy commodity department coming from the great milk producing state of Wisconsin, which produces so much of the milk uh, that comes into the nation's households. Now, Alvin, uh, I know that you've had a lot of experience in various fields, and you as well as the other directors of our commodity departments of dairy, grain, and meat are people that we're very proud of, and these are coordinated uh, with the assistance of other administrative people that have had various backgrounds, all of them farmers. And I know that, Alvin, uh, that the one thing that all of us recognize, uh, and that is that the dairy farmers put in longer hours of work throughout 12 months of the year than any other working group of farmers in America. And of course, it means that many of the families do the work uh, many of the wives, many of the children do the milking while the husbands are out either planting a crop, tending it, or harvesting it. And then, of course, this means that it's a, a really, truly a family operation. But the dairy farmers are really the most underpaid group of any segment of our population. Uh, I know that the consuming public, Alvin, uh, a lot of times thinks, well, 25 cents a quart for milk. Uh, really, how much does a dairy farmer in most areas uh, get for that milk on the farm? Well, basically, Mr. Staley, the dairy farmer himself and his family for all the efforts they put in producing the individual quart or hundredweight of milk receive very little in respect to what the consumer pays. Around seven cents is the average per quart that the farmer himself receives for the milk 
he produces. He has to, out of that, pay the trucking into town also. These points seem to me to be quite ridiculous, as you stated. Uh, these people work for around 37 cents an hour. They put in more hours, uh, year in and year out, than any other farm group that is producing farm goods in America today. They have a long history of producing a basic commodity that is needed on a day-to-day -day basis from farmer to handler to consumer, of whereby it seems to me that if the dairy farmer, through an organizational effort, much as NFO's program is, would put forth the necessary organization that he could change this almost overnight. Because dairy products being uh, considerably different than other farm products, they are produced on a day-to-day -day basis, and they are consumed in this same manner. In other words, it's a small amount each day going into the market. There is no one period of the year when you have a month's production coming in at one time or anything of the sort. It's from day to day. And in order for the farmer to price a commodity such as milk, he needs organization. And he needs sales groups that can work closer together than what they have in the past. And I think that by and large, we're getting ever closer to this as we keep moving along. Well, Alvin, this is an interesting point when you say dairy farmers need organization. Uh, we know that there are many, many uh, dairy groups organized uh, out here in almost every milk producing area. Uh, what, uh, what happens? Are these existing groups and uh, uh, do they uh, compete against each other or uh, or just what happens? Uh, the farmers are organized, but uh, uh, what, what really happens? Do, do they have divided uh, sales that compete against each other at this level, or what, what really happens in this, Alvin? Well, uh, the farmer selling his dairy products naturally has to sell it to some local processor or handler. In doing this, we find in making the different studies throughout the 12 state area, that there are approximately 800 individual selling groups representing the different groups of farmers today. These 800 uh, selling groups definitely compete with one another uh, trying to make a sale someplace in the market. Now, while you have 800 individual buying groups buying from the individual farmers, you have about eight major dairy groups that buy dairy products, butter, cheese, and powder nationwide. So you can see the terrific competition existing between the individual selling groups and what a time they must have trying to maintain the pricing uh, structures that they have today. By and large, if it were not for the government support programs, federal order programs, and the uh, what should I call them, the crutches that government has set up for the dairy industry to operate on, I don't believe we would see prices even as high as we have them today. Well, Alvin, I know that I've been in many dairy areas. And through the summer of 1965, dairy sales have continued. And through some of the heaviest dairy producing areas. And it's simply because <coughs> that the dairy farmers have become so discouraged because of the lack of return on their investment, the lack of wages, you might say, for their work. And so consequently, this is a serious situation. Now, you get into the situation, uh, what can be done and what is the NFO doing? I know that I have been in several discussions with existing groups where we have tried to explain uh, many years ago, in fact, that the organizational power in the dairy industry set up proper under a, a legal structure that would allow them to do just what uh, we're saying has to be done. Uh, this could have been done, but it seems as though there was reluctance on many of the existing groups to go together and unite the, the selling power that could have been united in a legal manner. So consequently, although we started organizing in a corn hog diversified area, we knew that it was necessary for us to go into the milk area, or the areas where milk is produced, and 
bring together the dairy farmers so that we could start establishing the organized power from the producer level. And this is where it has to be organized. Now, if we're going to analyze the dairy industry, I think the first thing we have to think about is uh, just how much uh, the nation's total production goes into uh, uh, manufactured milk and how much goes into the bottled uh, grade A class one milk. Well, we have roughly today a 50-50 split. It's, that figure is not just exact, but it is about 48% bottled milk and 52% manufactured milk. In this sense, uh, uh, dairy products are split about half and half manufactured and half the other half being grade A milk. Now, when it comes to pricing the two different commodities, manufactured milk and uh, grade A milk, we do find that the manufactured milk, by and large, is priced through uh, most generally a federal order in some areas set up around such as Chicago, Cleveland, Indianapolis, and so on, while you find your manufactured milk prices being established, namely on the support price that the government establishes from year to year. It wouldn't take too much of a price increase on manufactured milk in most areas to make a terrific difference to the dairy farmers, even in federal order areas. We have a rough breakdown of how this takes place on Lake. Well, fine, Alvin. And uh, the pricing structure on butter powder ratio, for example, a one cent increase on the butter powder ratio would return to the American dairy farmer a five cent increase on raw milk. You have on cheese a one cent increase on the pound of cheese to the consumer would levy a raise of prices on milk from the farm level going into cheese of 10 cents if there were 10 pounds of yield in 100 pounds of milk. So a very small increase in the price of dairy products could levy a very great return back on the farm level so far as individual producers are concerned. I find it quite shocking that most consumers have no idea of what percent the farmer is receiving from dairy products any place along the line. That's the reason I think the seven cents a quart, and after all, uh, how long does it take a, after the cows are milked on the farm uh, under the sanitary conditions that are required, and the farmer gets the seven cents a quart and he has to pay the trucking out of it. Uh, how long does that take that milk to get to, to the household and how much processing's in it? <laughs> it certainly didn't take as long to get it from the uh, farm to the consumer as it did for the old cow to get it from there into the processor. <laughs> this is about the point you get to on delivery of milk from farm level into processing groups. And certainly it is a commodity, as you stated, it is a number one commodity. It receives more inspection and red tape than any other farm product being delivered to consumers. You have in many, many areas inspectors from any number of states uh, inspecting these individual farms, making sure that they are producing a grade and quality of milk that is befitting almost of any price where you don't have these uh, rigid inspections on your meat and grain that we find uh, the dairy farmer competing with. Well, this is right. Uh, still, uh, the far, because of no processing, uh, the fact that there's no processing or very little involved means that uh, the cost of processing these other products, meat for example, should pretty well offset each other, shouldn't they, Alvin? And this means that uh, what is taken for the processing and the others, uh, uh, there's just something that's uh, very wrong as far as uh, the farmer receiving seven cents a quart for that milk uh, and the next uh, 24 hours it'll be at a consumer's table uh, at 25 cents a quart. Now, uh, what, uh, what, uh, first I think that we have to recognize that in order to be successful in bargaining in the dairy industry, that you cannot just bargain in one area because if you tried to bargain in one area, uh, all you can possibly bargain out of it is just a little improved efficiency in marketing, and this is fine, but this has generally been done. But if you try to do something about price in another area, uh, what happens in this case? Uh, what, what, what happens? There, there have been uh, dairy areas, uh, maybe even as large as a state or more, 
that have made uh, an effort. Uh, what happened to their efforts? Well, the same old story happens with the dairy farmer that happens with any other farm commodity. And they used to tell us, by the way, Mr. Staley, that, well, if you fellas take the milk out of the state of Wisconsin, we'll ship it in from Minnesota. Yes. And uh, when we finally organized Wisconsin and Minnesota, then they turned around and told us, well, if you hold milk back here in these areas, we'll ship it in from New York and Pennsylvania. Yes, that's right. When we started organizing in those areas, then they said they would ship it in from Canada. Now, I don't know where they'll get it from next, but it's the same old story of one group just setting just in back of the other one that always is subject to shipping these products into an area trying to price it if an individual area tries to price the commodity. It's true uh, with grain and meat in this same manner. But dairy products being what they are certainly seem to me to be one of the easier commodities to price in this respect if the farmers in the different states, such as Minnesota, Wisconsin, Iowa, in fact, throughout the whole NFO territory or area, would sit down and work out this problem together. Uh, NFO has suggested a legal formula for this. It's a matter of the individual marketing groups today enlarging their scope and vision so far as marketing problems are concerned. And instead of working from just a county level, or a district level, or going from there up to an individual state level, for them to start looking at their problem as a national problem and working together on those bases, certainly we know most any group can solve their problems through a self-help program. Well, Alvin, I think what you brought out is so important because the people that they're selling to, those eight major companies you're talking about, uh, buy all over the dairy producing area. And so you cannot be successful in bargaining unless you do uh, the bargaining over this entire area. Now, I think another important point is that marketing orders, uh, the federal uh, support programs, are only minimums. There's nothing to keep uh, the bargaining efforts bringing price above these if, uh, if there's sufficient bargaining power to get the price. Now, I think there's one thing important, and you pointed it out. I live in northwest Missouri, and we're in a diversified farming area. And I remember when we first started organizing an NFO, they used to say, well, if you just try to do anything for the dairymen, we'll ship Wisconsin and Minnesota milk in on you. And then, of course, uh, we said, well, we'll go out and organize uh, the dairy farmers in Wisconsin and Minnesota, which we have. And then where do you think you're going to get it? And as you said, they said, well, New York, New Jersey. And of course, when they get to Canada, Canadian milk production uh, isn't very big, you know as far as our population is concerned. And of course, the thing about it is our program is set up so that we can have a surplus disposal program developed uh, through our master contracts with processors. And uh, many of the people have always said, well, processors won't even talk to NFO. Uh, they won't even sit down and talk to you. Well, processors in all the commodities are even the largest. Uh, many of the largest processors are sitting down investing uh, with NFO. Now, the important point is that they have problems that uh, we can help meet that haven't been met uh, by getting the production there to them uh, in the area that uh, it needs to come from in order to be most practical as far as their plant operations. But I think that it might be interesting, uh, I'm, I'm sure it would, uh, because you've told me where these master contracts have been signed with processors. Uh, uh, lately, uh, tell me a few of the places uh, you have been to show the scope uh, of this album and uh, the fact that processors are not only visiting, they're signing master contracts and then we'll discuss briefly the master contracts, which are, of course, the heart of our program. Well, in the last 10 days, two weeks, we have had uh, cooperation in signing contracts all the way from Idaho over to uh, the southwestern corner, uh, southeastern corners of Wisconsin. I took in some discussions last week with processing groups out in the Colorado area. These groups, by and large, seem to be uh, taking a different view of the dairy situation than what they have in the past. I do find many of them telling me, quite frankly, at this stage of the game, that uh, in years gone by, individual groups such as uh, our marketing milk in the southwestern areas, that these groups did at one time 
try to sit down and formulate a program much as we have suggested at this time. However, these efforts failed, namely because of lack of participation by farmers to urge the different processing groups to carry out this type of a marketing procedure. And I think it's very important for the processing groups as well as the individual farmers at this point to understand that through the NFO program specifically, we have an opportunity not just to talk to the individual farmer about becoming a member of NFO and its dairy marketing program, but we also have a chance to bring his knowledge to the processing level and talk the problem over there also. By having both groups out selling a program of this type, certainly it can be accomplished. Well, Alvin, I think you brought out some points that are so important, mm -hmm. and when you were talking about the contracts being signed uh, in, from Idaho uh, on over into Wisconsin uh, in a 10-day period. Uh, I remember you coming in with a group of contracts from northern Minnesota uh, and I believe over in uh, South Dakota uh, shortly before that. And then uh, I remember a uh, short time before that uh, you or some of the people in the Dairy Commodity Department told me about being east of the Pennsylvania line and, and I believe on down into Tennessee uh, Kentucky into that area and this shows the great effort that is being made over the entire area. Now in these master contracts when a processor signs a master contract uh, basically what uh, what does the master contract uh, uh, incorporate in it or what is incorporated in the master contract basically? Uh, uh, the dairy contracts for dairy production these to me are a very uh, practical contract for any dairy farmer to work under. The dairy farmer in the past, and we have never touched on this too much, has signed many, many contracts with many, many processing groups. However, the contracts he's had signed with the different marketing groups have all of them been a simple contract for a supply. One of the big factors in the NFO program and its contracts is that these contracts establish a delivery to local processors. They also establish a grade and quality to be delivered on a stipulated pricing structure. They establish still further a year-to-year -year supply feature for processing groups to work with. This certainly gives them the benefit of the doubt by saying the production will be there from year to year on such and such a standard and with such and such a volume so that they can do an efficient marketing job throughout the industry. Well, these are basic. Then the whole important core of the NFO program is first for the producers to organize so they can bargain together, right? Right. And this is what the NFO has been building, a structure whereby the producers can make their desires felt and an information structure where the producers can and analyze the entire marketing structure and decide on their own uh, how they're going to market and where as they're developing their bargaining power. And this is, their, this is their individual initiative that they must take in this phase. And then, of course, after these have been organized, then you're talking about the master contracts at the processor level, which stipulates the price that the producer is going to be paid, which is 605 base price for class one grade A mail. The manufactured milk, uh, the price is five dollars. From four dollars to five fifty. Yes, varying on the area. Right. And uh, then all these points uh, are incorporated in the contract. And the one thing that uh, really amazed me was when I heard existing dairy groups one time say, "Well, dairy farmers can't get a price for their milk, or they'll price themselves out of the market." And I heard so many people say, "Well, if." hogs ever go to 2275 and what people don't realize is that these are average prices over the year we're talking about there's allowances for seasonal variations and all but they said if hogs ever go to 2275 why you'll lose your market well this always amazed me uh, and then it amazes me more because i haven't heard anybody talking about that and the people are still eating pork and I'm sure that they're going to continue to drink milk, just like I bought this suit of clothes, although the price was up. Uh, it means simply that the American public has to realize that the American farmer is a very important segment of our economy. He purchased so much steel, so much gas, so much rubber, so many of the things that are manufactured. 
and that this great purchasing power cannot use unless farmers have a fair price for their products. And so, Alvin, this just simply means that uh, the rest of the nation cannot continue to have the profits that they've been enjoying, or the working people cannot continue to have the wages that they have at the present time unless the farmer also gets a price for his product to help buy some of these yeah. things. Now then, back to the dairy program uh, and back to the effect of it. We're organized over this large area. Uh, we've organized and, of course, signed many, many contracts with processors. And this means that the bargaining power of dairy farmers have continued to be increased. Now, as we build this bargaining power, do you think farmers really realize how much strength the NFO has and that they really understand that this organization is built on the principle of bargaining effectively on all major commodities and that all of them have to be brought up in relative balance, that the minor commodities also will fit into the pattern as this bargaining power is increased. Do you think the people really understand? When they talk about bargaining for farmers, do they understand what they're talking about? I, do, I sometimes wonder whether the individual farmer, there seems to be no doubt in his mind that he understands that selling together can get him a, a better price because he understands the business formulas and practices of large business groups throughout the nation and their ability to establish prices on the farmer's goods that he has to buy. These are uh, simple mathematics to him in that sense. There seems to be a little bit of doubt in his mind, possibly, that he can get enough of his fellow man to go along with this type of a program. But again, I get down to the point of, in the different discussions, with a, a lot of non-members and so on at the different bargaining sessions talking contract on milk uh, these people seem to believe that at today that this type of a program is coming they feel possibly that nfo is maybe pushing it a little bit too fast but at the same time with the large number of sale bills we have hanging in the local banks uh, the local stores your local county papers each month and each week it, uh, time is of essence if we are to save the dairy production in the areas where it's at. Well, Alvin, I think this is very important. The one thing that I think is so important is that the processors, they understand farmers' bargaining power. They know that their processing plant is only worth junk price unless there's milk going through it if it's a milk processing plant. That's right. They understand that. Right. And so consequently, when they see farmers organizing, all they're doing is guessing whether farmers are going to successfully organize enough production or whether they're not. And those processors say, yes, we want to sign the master contractor saying, really, we want that production before it gets away. This is really what right. they're saying right. to you. Now, the whole thing seems to boil down to this, that the farmers have to realize that by bargaining together, by selling together, they have the ability, they have the power. And I know from my discussions with you that now that we have the pro producers organized in great numbers over such a large area, that as we're driving to get more of them organized, as they join with the NFO, that as we build our bargaining power, that the steps that you're taking, uh, I'm sure that you're confident, and I am too, that they are going to start a price rise uh, for milk at the farm level in the not-too-distant future. We have the power, the strength, and now all we have to do is build on that in order to get the gains that are necessary for farmers, dairy farmers, as well as others, to get the cost of production plus a reasonable profit. The historic records of the United States government prove conclusively that farm prices must be in balance with wages and interest costs in order to have a fully operating economy and relative full employment for our nation's people. Government records also prove that each dollar of gross farm income generates seven dollars of national income. How much longer can we afford to underpay our nation's farmers when it is costing our nation seven dollars for each dollar of underpayment to our American farmers? The members of the National Farmers Organization are calling on the rest of the American farmers to join with them in an all-out effort to solve this farm problem. Join now. Thank you.